Okay, welcome to this rubber stamp show and tell. We have the rubber stamp madness, November, December 2004. How that became 20 years ago, I'll never know. Issue 138 at this point in time, rubber stamp madness is um, the format that it is uh, to be consistent with other types of magazines, to fit in uh, magazine racks and uh, different stores, chain stores and uh, places like... Uh, you know, the big uh, booksellers, Barnes & Noble, probably Borders and uh, the other types of uh, sellers like that. But Rubber Stamp Madness used to be this big tabloid size. Then it went down to a uh, little bit of a smaller size and eventually ended up in the standard. Um, I don't know what dimensions this is, but uh, it can fit in a, a rack in the store and widely distributed. Okay, so uh, the holidays right here. I'm a little late for this one, but uh, I don't know. I was looking through it today and uh, looking for a certain writer and uh, seeing if I can find them. But let's see what we have in here. I'm, I don't want to, you know, stay on uh, these uh, each page too long because this is a very thick book, book at this point in time. I don't know if it was like the... Uh, it's, it's right in the heyday of uh, rubber stamp. Uh, rubber stamping in terms of um, manufacturing, uh, conventions, and retail stores alike, the, uh, the full gamut of the, uh, of the uh, industry. But um, it's a very thick book, and typically if you were a manufacturer, you were, you know, advertising in Rubber Stamp Madness at this point in time. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Looks like Marvie Uchida, big seller within the uh, the industry. He's got the inside uh, full page right here, color. And they're selling embossing tools. I can't tell you how many people um, from this, around this period and earlier, probably got into rubber stamping because of embossing. They saw embossing and it was like, that is for them, you know, and... I used to do these surveys, just informal surveys, you know, when we were waiting around uh, for a class to start. Um, I'd travel around the country teaching classes, and oftentimes I'd just, you know, be shooting the breeze, and I would ask, uh, you know, whoever was in there at the time while we were waiting for the uh, the class time to start, how did you get into stamping? And I, it occurred to me that about 70% of the people that were into stamping um, in the 90s probably would say they got into it via uh the impetus was um embossing okay it later turned into stampin up as the main thrust of uh you know their interest in the hobby or their usage of rubber stamps but um that was a big thing okay so hampton art rubber stamps right here with their holiday things okay so in this holiday issue you're going to see a lot of ads based around holiday types of um products okay so that's what uh, Rubber Stamp Madness would um, say. Okay, our issue is going to be um, Halloween or our issue is going to be something like, you know, there was some kind of theme to it. So if you wanted to, you can kind of base your um, advertisement around that theme. I, I didn't always do that, uh, you know, because I was, you know, scenic stamping and, uh, you know, that isn't, I mean, it like it, if it was around this time, I could do a winter scene if I wanted to, but I typically just did my own thing. Zot's Crystal Clear Adhesive Dots. Ah, okay. That's kind of interesting. Touche rubber stamps, stamping supplies. Okay, look at these like blank bags right here or these boxes. Like a, it's like a, not like a takeout box, but um, buygiftwrap.com. Pastel chalk pencils, pretty cool. So at this point in time, a lot of people, you know, in rubber stamping, um, yeah, I'd say it's the same thing now. There's a lot of things in the art industry that, um, you know, is certainly applicable to stamping. And a lot of the stamping products have their origin in art, and they just repackaged it for um, stamping. But, um, you know, uh, I say that just because this, uh, you know, these pastel chalk pencils that is probably geared towards the art industry, art stores and things like that. And not everyone uh, always went to art stores. Um, some people kind of figured that uh, was a good source for things, but um, you know, it was largely a stamping uh, targeted media that they'd be going after. Color Box by ClearSnap, uh, a company that's gone, but they were a big player in the um, 
rubber stamping um, industry, and they would come out with their own. They were one of the few places that did their own, I don't know what you call it, mold, I don't know, whatever, injection types of uh, dyes for rubber stamp, you know, crafting specific products. You often see other things, um, again, going back to the art industry, just repackaged um, for rubber stamping or things like makeup brunch brushes or something like that. You know, they'll some manufacturer just getting a hold of the manufacturer and say, okay, I want these black handles in different colors to make it more colorful for the um, uh, the crafting world, the rubber stamping world, and we'll call them ink applicators instead of makeup brushes or something like that. But um, color, Clear Snap was one of those places that um, did their own thing, including the really fantastic color box uh, stylus tools, which are now gone too, because again, Clear Snap is out of business now. So great manufacturer and uh, you know developer of uh, all kinds of things for uh, uh, stampers. Okay, so anyways, um, you can see this goes through page 89 right here, 120 looking ahead, but uh, store listings, just a really large um, kind of entity within the stamping world here. Heirloom Productions, I used to do several of their shows, um, just looking through here. I used to do the Del Mar show, the San Mateo show, not all the time, but I've done them before. Portland, uh, Puyallup, West Springfield. Those uh, Puyallup and West Springfield were always on the circuit. Um, looks like Oregon happened twice a year. And uh, let me see. I don't see. This was Arlington right here in Texas, and then there's Pasadena, Texas. It later turned into the Grapevine show, so they didn't have these two shows, I don't think. It looks like they consolidated it from Pasadena and Arlington into that Grapevine show, um, which happened twice a year. Uh, oh, there was a convention in Spokane. That, I don't think that was always there. It was, it was always the Puyallup show. One of the busiest shows I ever went to was the first Puyallup show, probably around 1994, 10 years before this. Maybe not that far. Maybe it was 97 or something like, oh, here's Grapevine right here, November 5th and 6th. So Grapevine turned into twice a year. So instead of the Arlington show, I'm guessing the, yeah, the Arlington show just turned it. They just did Grapevine twice. But uh, Heirloom Productions, they used to do the um, doll show you know, and then they turned into um, heirloom productions and uh, just the rubber stamp festivals. So there's still a lot of them are still going on, but put on by a different entity, usually within the region of whatever shows were still going on. Leavenworth Jackson, uh, my sister's favorite company. I love them, too. One of those companies that's been around for a long time. I think Le Leavenworth Jackson was the first. I believe the first art rubber stamp website out there. Okay. And then when we did our website too, I think we were the second stamps gates was the second art rubber stamp, um, website out there. But I remember looking around and Leavenworth Jackson was already up there. So it was just my friend in it at college and he just wanted to learn HTML. So he just kind of threw up a website for stampscapes and I didn't even know it, but he just, it was basically just scanned pages of our hard copy catalog. But um, if you did a web crawler or any of those web searching engines back in the day, um, ask Jeeves, uh, hot, Bot, was that Hotbot? All those things. Stampscapes would have came up on that first page if you just entered in rubber stamps. There weren't even really any business rubber stamp places at the time, so pretty proud about that. Uh, not due to me, but it was my friend that was uh, that put it up there. So uh, big thanks to my friend Scott for uh, getting on that and doing that. Sukaneko still out there making their. Uh, Great inks. Um, you see they're versifying here. Now it's the versifying Claire. Mail art was a big thing. Still back in the day, you'd stamp your envelopes and uh, do really cool things with um, 
uh, male art, they called it. So I still have that Versafine pad there, and I probably got it 20 years ago when this thing came out. I didn't really use it too much, though. Beeswax, uh, great company. I Now, I knew a lot of these companies just by flipping around in here. I, I didn't know all of them, though. Um, but I'd flip through um, these uh, these magazines, and I would just, I don't know. It, everything was just so busy, so I didn't uh, I didn't read everything. But I'd often see, you know, what types of things were out there at the time, you know, in terms of uh, new types of uh, accessories, especially. I wasn't using a lot of them either, though. Um, I was using die based inks and glossy cardstock for the most part. Artist trading cards. Okay, so the ATCs, of course, came out at the time and people started trading those. But before then, they were trading pins mostly at conventions, but then it turned into the ATC. And you still see um, one of the conventions that I had been going to out in Mesa, Arizona, still had their ATC contest. So pretty cool. That was a really good, um, the ATCs are a really great um, format. Just because people can put them into an AC, ATC, you know, like baseball card um, holder or something like that, and you can put together your collection. But, um, you know, people would exchange those uh, at shows, and it was uh, really cool. The, the pin trading thing was really cool, too. But you'd see here, uh, everything for the artist trading cards and introducing the ATC wizard tool, uh, whatever that is. So cool stuff, you know. Uh, art of tell tessellation, tessellation stamping, whatever that is. Um, interesting. Stamp abilities. Okay, so this was post Stampa Rosa and uh the house mouse um designs i yeah these are house mouse right here boy you know by 2004 huh black and white card designs that's cool oh we should do that again you know some black and white uh, just pieces i don't know if that means grayscale as well or if it just means hard black and white but um kind of monochrome grayscale you know, you can learn a lot by doing um, just black and white because there's a that's a higher focus um, when you're doing that typically on things like texture and uh, certainly contrast. Um, but certain things, you know, when color is not involved, you became a little bit more aware of it um, and it sensitizes you to those things so that when you go back to color, um, you might have kind of a greater kind of a awareness of things like value and texture and pattern and things like that um you know than if you only do color all the time look at this hot potatoes so hot potatoes um oh my gosh i forgot her name um from hot potatoes but used to see her on um oh my gosh that tv uh crafting uh, program. I'll think of her name after this or at some point in time. Uh, but Dee Grooney used to be on it. Argon Wild, still around, of course. Gary Berlin, wholesale rubber stamp and scrapbooking supplies here. I used to, I think you used to be able to get your, um, I don't know, I don't know if they were the person, that, the people that just had carried a bunch of um, different manufacturers things or if they were the place that uh, that also made things to make rubber stamps i'm not sure look at this the amazing removable snowman ornament card oh so you send a card like that it's dangling around in there and i bet you it's one of those things where you can take that off yeah and it becomes an ornament you can put it on your tree or something like that but i don't know if you take it out of there and then you put it on your tree then you have this card right here i, I think if someone got a card like that, I think they would keep that on there. Okay, so here's Auntie Amy's. Boy, Auntie Amy sure had a lot of uh, conventions here. I never did any Auntie Amy shows except for Riverside right here. 
it, as you can see, just between heirloom and um, uh, Auntie Amy, and then there were uh, the stamp of the hand, you know, and rubber rama shows. There was a lot of uh, conventions around, but they always wanted me to do the Ventura show. <laughs> Ventura is a small city, you know, and uh, I never wanted to go up there for that, even though it's like an hour and a half from uh, my mom, but I would see them down at, uh, you know, the LA convention. So I was already doing the Los Angeles uh, area conventions three times a year. Riverside was a little bit different. Riverside's about an hour from LA and uh, I don't know. I did that maybe twice or something like that um, because it wasn't too far for me either. You know, I don't know if I I don't know if well, that was, yeah, that was a one day show. So, okay, so I didn't have to uh, stay overnight anywhere. Let me see, was Auntie Amy Denver, Colorado? No, I couldn't remember. But boy, they were busy doing a lot of shows. Mirror Image, one of my favorite. Uh, artists in the industry. I don't have, I don't know if I have any of his designs, but um, I sure respected his artwork and uh, I don't know his things. He was a big life drawing uh, artist. Judykins right here, of course. A professional art marker case, huh? So coming over from the art industry, probably. I don't, you know, a lot of people didn't get into um, different types of art markers. Um, you know, the design and uh, I don't know, the xylene based types of markers. It was only until um, I would say the alcohol based Copics um, did I see um, a lot of interest in the crafting industry for your art markers. There was always Tombos and La Plumes, but those were based on kind of more crafters or, you know, hobbyists or something like that. But you didn't see um, people getting into traditional markers that you would see at an art store. Now, I didn't see a lot of Copics, you know, going back in the day, but industrial designers and graphic designers and things like that would get, I think it was called AD, uh, AD, you know, these markers with the chisel tips and they would do their comps, you know, comprehensives, their the roughs uh, on that type of thing. And then there were um, design, I think that was the other brand of markers. There was typically one or two, I don't think there were three brands of markers that were the big ones, but um, you'd see everyone getting that. And then Copics came around and I, I don't know, I think they're probably Pantone based or something like that. You can get so many different like specific colors and uh, you know, you saw that. Northern Hardwoods, that became my source of um, mounts. Mounts, I switched, you know, my wooden mounts uh, suppliers. I probably went with maybe six or seven different suppliers in my day of, you know, all wood mounts being sold. But um, Northern Hardwoods, I ran into a show. I think it was, I went to HIA, which later became known as CHA. And I was walking around there and um, they were there. And I don't know, a lot of wood manufacturers, they were selling at one point in time and then they weren't selling or they just became so busy that it just took forever for you to get um, your wood. So you'd have to find a new place to uh, get it. So, uh, boy, we switched. That is one of those um, supplies that uh, we, you know, switched out a lot. The ink pad, New York, they're still around, I think. If they are, you got to go check them out. I think they're in New York City. Um, there's D. Grunig with the Ot Light. Um, the Ot Light was always a, a color correct um, type of light. And like this was the small one right here. Um, or temperature correct. Um, light and uh, she um, became a big uh, uh, proponent for them in the art world uh, crafting world okay they were always big in the art world for painters and things like that as you're painting you want to be able to uh, have a good idea of what that painting is going to look like under natural light or something like that so you'd want to paint under correct lighting so if you're doing something at night you needed one of these types of lights for that 
you know, it didn't have to be that brand, but um, that was the brand out there. But you saw her name um, on these types of things. I mean, she wasn't the originator of it or something like that, but, um, you know, um, she kind of brought it over to the um, crafting world, just like uh, Marvy markers, you know, uh, making that the big um, ink in the rubber stamping world. Let's see, Fishbone Graphics. I don't think I remember them papercandy.com seems like pretty cool designs right there rubberstampmakers.org hmm I don't know if that was a collective or something like that um, holiday types of cards yeah people are still doing you know the this type of uh, card right here this is a pretty cool and this is where they're stamping white on you know a darker paper that's a really good way to work different scenes simple elegant you know i mean these types of cards would look still you know look good uh today i mean it's 20 years ago but i don't know, you know i don't think it looks dated or anything like that i mean if i go back to like uh like 10 years previous, 1994, things look pretty different um, in terms of rubber stamp madness. Um, a lot more of your kind of non-original artwork, a lot more engravings and a lot of stamping on envelopes, that type of thing. And it was a little bit of a different crowd than say card makers. People were making cards for sure, but it was a different type of thing um, 10 years previous. So a lot of um, advancements or, you know, growth, and uh, kind of, I don't know, it's even that evolution, I'd call it, in the crowd and in, uh, you know, the different types of uh, formats for uh, your cards right here. Let's see, I want to rubber stamp events. Okay, so this is the um, convention that I just went to in Mesa, Arizona. So, yeah, it was like, it's always been like the first week in uh, November, and I think first week in march or something like that so our shows for 2005 yeah they were already doing a lot of them so here's your third um coordinator there's probably five main coordinators like this one right here in my room the perfect place for stamping so you have your pad rack here the tools right here decal cutters a couple brayers on the wall I can't zoom in too far because my camera's going to go out of focus. But it looks like a pretty good space there. Um, I don't see who's... Uh, Owen. Joyce Owen. Okay. Oh, and looks like uh, the drawers for your wood-mounted stamps like that. If anyone ever found flat files, you know, somewhere like used flat files, that would be the um, the greatest uh, stamp holders ever, you know, because flat files were hundreds of dollars. So um, if anyone found like a business going out of business or used flat files for cheap, that was always one of those big uh, fines for a rubber stamper. You can see their space right here. That looks good and creative adventures and stamping so this was the one that was in um kind of northern uh, um ohio and i used to do this show in akron april i i really miss that akron show that was a really great show and i've seen these stamps here before this victorian garden jolly good show the victorian age via rubber stamps Right here. So some pretty cool designs right here. Real professional looking designs too. Uh, whoever the artist was for that. You can tell they had, uh, you know, they've had a lot of uh, training in uh, art. But these are pretty cool right here. I really like this, uh, you know, this spread right here on uh, these scenes right here. I don't know if it's all the same stuff or this, this might have been uh, 
Okay, so beeswax, you know, that ad before. Looks like there was a stamp of Barbara in here too. Okay, so the rubber stamp and scrapbook expo here. So this became, they became a pretty big um, uh, coordinator for shows. But uh, uh, they were just, coordinators were kind of in like a war with each other, you know, and there was just basically this thing where if there's a, if there's a show in a city already, it was kind of known, you know, it was an unwritten rule that you don't go and put another show right in that same city or something like that. Or you don't put it like another show, like the week before, certainly, for another show. And this guy was really aggressive and he started putting on shows um, in these other areas. And that that's not good because it hurts the local infrastructure of stores there if there's just way too many shows there. If there's one show, or it depends how many, what the population is, what the stamping population is, but um, it got to be pretty, pretty crazy with the number of shows that was going on. Um, uh, but he was pretty aggressive about that. And he would put on shows in areas where there never should be a show. And a lot of people would do, manufacturers would sign up for it, but... Um, he got to be so desperate that he would send out emails to manufacturers saying, hey, you know, are you going to go to the show? Um, because myself and a bunch of friends are planning on attending. Uh, and they would do something, you know, like put some fake name on there, right? But they found out, they traced it back um, via the IP address on a computer and, you know, there was a stamping forum for manufacturers and it they found out that it was all being sent out by this one coordinator, you know, just going out and trying to fish, you know, get uh, manufacturers to do his shows. And some of them were really duds, but that got, got out and it was like, oh my God, you know, we went to the show and maybe there was like a hundred people that attended the entire weekend or something like that. So, you know, he would try to get people to do that show the next time. And, uh, you know, he would do tactics like that. You'd go to a show some of them, not all of them, some of them were pretty good, but um, I never did them because I already had my circuit, you know, already done with established shows. But um, I don't know, there'd be things like, uh, I don't know, like a nut stand there or purses or like insurance booths or something like that just to fill in there. Or it would be pretty bad because he'd say, uh, he'd sell booths and there were like so many empty booths at for that show. And he would say, okay, hey, if you want to do the show, I'll give you the booth for, um, I don't know, you can do the booth, I'll sell it to you for 250 bucks. Where someone right next to you paid $1,000 for their equally sized booth, yeah, which didn't make them happy either. You know what I mean? As it wouldn't. But there were crazy things like that that went on in the industry. And a lot of it wasn't good, you know, for the uh, industry as a whole. All right, so these are um, all kinds of uh, different stores here. And it wasn't all the stores either. Let me see. So Stamp Quest for more info. I don't know what this was here. You know, this Stamp Quest. Or maybe this place took out an, like a two-page ad here or something like that. And then maybe... Um, or maybe, I don't know, maybe it was one of those things where they sold wholesale clients that carry their stamps. They would put them in a ad. I don't know. I'm not sure how that worked. Or maybe it was just, I'm not sure what this ad, you know, is going on. I, I mean, I could look at it and figure it out. Oh, there's my Stampscapes ad right there. With the Lakeside Cove Large. And I was playing around with things like compasses at the time. Wearable art, okay, so doing people doing stamped uh, like jewelry and things like that, or you know, stamping clothes on that book right there. Used to be able to go into um, you know, Barnes and Noble or uh, Borders or something like that, and there was a big section of crafting, and you'd find a lot of those um, you know, rubber stamping books, okay, so addicted rubber stamps. And then there was an addicted to scrapbooking, which I think came first, but this guy. He had some big um, 
company that he sold and he had a lot, you know, it was flush with uh, millions of dollars or something like that. And rubber stamping was getting, you know, pretty big at this point in time. It had a lot of momentum as far as well as um, scrapbooking. So his thing was, um, and a lot of manufacturers were careful not to sell to online sellers, you know, back around this time or a little bit earlier too, mostly earlier, I'd say. Or the 2000 or something like that, um, late 90s, and um, because they don't want the, you know some company just out there um, selling online and then you know just saying um, okay here's like 20 percent off everything because it would hurt everyone else who carried your stamps already in a store and they didn't have any store okay they might have had a small store or something like that but it was mostly a warehouse and online but. 250,000 stamps and accessories. So um, they ordered from us and it was like initial order is, okay, Kevin, we just want 25 of your most popular designs and we want X amount worth of them, okay? And one time I, I wrote an email to them. I just said, hey, you know, I didn't know who they were because they didn't say rubber stamps, addicted rubber stamps.com were just an online seller or something like that. A lot of places didn't have policies for online sellers at the time, but I found out about that and I didn't want to hurt all of my existing clients. So I just said, Hey, you know, I, you know, I, you didn't tell me that you're just an online seller. And, um, uh, Lee from um, Limited Edition Rubber Stamps happened to be there at the time. So she said, oh, well, you know, you got that. And, she, and then she she says, hey, this is Lee. You know, she was responding to my email because I guess they told her. And she goes, yeah, you know, if you don't want them to discount your stuff, you just tell them. So it's like, oh, OK, OK, you know, yeah, you can carry our stuff. And, you know, just as long as you don't give these mass discounts or something like that. Because, again, you know, a lot of... Um, storefront places they, they couldn't discount it because um, they have all kinds of overhead and things like that and they have to sell those stamps for a certain amount that's why things like uh, that 40 percent off at michael's always kind of hurt them anytime some manufacturers started selling to like michael's instantly that manufacturer's stamps in all the different rubber stamp stores became unsellable all of a sudden because people just knew that they can get it for 40 percent off you know, one stamp at Michael's or something like that. So I saw all of those manufacturers that started selling to big chain um, stores go out of business like within a, like a year or a year and a half or something like that. It happened every time. But uh, because, you know, those chain stores didn't demonstrate and do examples of the uh, things, um, those stamps anymore, you know, and uh, the big sellers weren't either. So... Um, it was a different type of thing back then. But here, Addicted to Rubber Stamps would buy um, a certain amount of advertising space, okay, like this. And if they sold your stamps, if you were, they were one of your clients, okay, um, Addicted to Rubber Stamps would say, okay, we've bought this amount of um, advertising space. It's all these purple pages like this. Um, and you can take out an ad in our space right here so you can write whatever you want or do any kind of ad you want and instead of it being um like an ad like this might be you know if you get it just straight in rsm it was a certain amount or in rubber stamp you know rubber stamper or magazine or all those other magazines it might be a certain price but if you got it through them it was like a fraction of it at the time so um I do that in uh, some of those different magazines. I would always get my ma ad in Rubber Stamp Madness, okay? But in the other magazines, um, I would just take in an ad within the addicted to rubber stamps.com advertising spread, and it would be so much cheaper. It'd be like, instead of, you know, $1,000 for a quarter page full color ad, it might be $250 or something like that. It was really small. Um, because they got a huge discount and then they would just, I don't know if they were losing money, you know, breaking it up or something like that. But anyways, that was, that's how that went. <laughs> okay. So more, um, okay. Now, so this is the, uh, where the stamps are and here's all these different 
rubber stamp stores right here, scrapbooking stores. But at this point in time, it was still a lot of, um, you know, just rubber stamp dedicated stores. It wasn't uh, scrapbooking at this point in time. So if you look at all these different things, it's like stamp something, stamp Diego, stampaholics, stamp addict, stamp Lewis, rubber, st Rylet's rubber stamp in good stamp. You know what I mean? It's not like memories, something or something like that. It's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's all rubber stamps, um, here, uh, as opposed to, you know what I mean? Like, uh, the fusion rubber stamp and scrapbooking type of stores. Oh, there's also scrap and stamp right here, but most of them still, you know, at this point in time, still rubber stamp specific. Incline to stamp, one of the best users of, uh, Stampscape stamps and teaching it was Pam Klein at Incline to Stamp there. I taught in St. Genevieve once and uh, she carried like a full line of um, uh, Stampscape stamps there. And she was a fantastic user of, uh, of the stamps. Taught a lot of the stores here in Maine. Here's Penn Ventures and mainly I think I taught there maybe uh, stamps and stuff I taught at several of those stores out there loved to going out to Bain and uh, teaching out there but look at these it goes on and on you know in terms of the number of stores and they were just popping up like crazy it was really hard to keep up with um, all the the rubber stamp um, stores out there back in the day because you were having to make up wood mounted rubber stamps and those things take a long time to make and again you had to source things you know we were getting in uh wood by the pallet so the calendar so this one breaks down the different um conventions in different areas so it's going with the heirloom stamp and scrap expo you know anti amy's all those different um stamp entities look at this imaginaire was still out there um always loved their uh Kind of their, I don't have too many of their designs, but they would do these like super accurate renderings of uh, jets, like historical and everything. Like here's like a little wind up right here, and you had the uh, the bulletin board here, so you can do, um, you know, you can add a, you know, you can request a pen pal or something like that. Uh, you can sell things on here if you want to, you know, you can take out a small ad. I don't even know if these things were cost anything, but, um, you know, they, there'd be even things like pen pals. I'm into whatever, you know, and people would look at that and, you know, or sometimes people used to do a Stampscapes exchange. Um, you send in 10 scenes or something like that with stampscapes and you'd get 10 back or something like that i think joyce used to put that on um bulletin board ad let me see right here no charge for see pen pals mail art listings stamp art exchanges rubber stamp exchanges and contest rubber stamp companies and other business can submit word classifieds at a cost of dollar 75 a word but yeah these uh, little, you know, I don't know if they did every single thing, you know, that was uh, submitted for the bulletin board. There's only so much room in this bulletin board. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it was really amazing that you can get it for free. And if you're a rubber stamper at this time, chances are you got this magazine. So, like, I don't know what percentage. A lot of people would buy it in the store, um, too. But uh, you had so many people, and here's rubber stamp, uh, the RSC original rubber stamp convention. That was the Carson show, basically. But um, there was the rubber stamp convention, and then there was Rubberama there. But so a lot of different um, companies. Hunter Proof Press is still out there. Different um, owners than uh, back then. Fistful of rubber stamps. I had. I've been using. Um, Oh, a couple of stamps, uh, like this ship from them. And I don't know, they went out of business um, way back when. But, um, and here's more stores. You know, this is, I don't know, this is like a, oh, this is Sue Gilman and company. So she was the one that um, um, 
was a rep, I think. Here's Rubber Stamping Depot. They make my um, rubber and my rubber stamp sets. Rubber Soul, visit Paul's Bow. I taught out there in Paul's Bow before, and they had uh, two or three stores, I think. Peddler's Pack, taught there before. Um, they were a store and manufacturer there in Beaverton, Oregon. The alt an altered greeting card, lady in waiting. Okay, so look at this right here. Stamp your heart out right here in Claremont, California. That's in I don't know if they're are they LA County or are they Orange County. I'm not quite sure, but um, Claremont. That was the first, as far as I know, rubber stamp specific store and it was a really small store i don't know how many square feet it was i'd say that retail space was probably like 10 by 10 out on the floor and then there was this counter and i think there was like slat wall behind them and there's a bunch of um, stamps on that but joan i i can't remember her last name but she was the first um stamp store um, uh, because I taught out there and we talked about it. Uh, I, I taught out there, I think it was in, um, 80, no, 90, it might've been 1990. Okay. And there were, there were other stores that carried stamps. Okay. But not like your just stamp specific store. Okay. There were the stores that had, you know, section of stamps or something like that but i think she was the first dreamweaver stencils Let's see her at uh, stampendous here i'd see them uh, dreamweaver at uh, all the uh, cha shows let's see here stamp me tender going to graceland uh, interesting so um Elvis, you know, themed uh, section right here. This is interesting right here. So Greenhound, Greenhorn Valley Art Stamp Company presents champion dog profiles and rubber stamps. So look at this. So all kind of, you know, accurate looking um, stamps right here of uh, different dogs. So someone was really busy doing some stippled... Uh, works right here of all your I don't know I guess just straight pure braids or something like that but they have everything here and they were probably still drawing them I don't know they probably got uh, other types of uh, inquiries right here but um, in Colorado City Colorado so you were able to find so many different types of specific things back then these days, you know, if someone asks me about some things, a lot of times I can help them kind of find something like, uh, and I might be able to direct them to, you know, a, a company that's around if they're looking for any kind of particular design. But, uh, you know, someone asked me for, hey, you know, where can I get a petite Bassett Griffin? You know what I mean? I don't know if we're finding that these days, unless they're still around, you know, I don't know. Or someone took over a line or something like that, which happened a lot of times, but um, I don't know. A lot of times when I see someone, uh, a line getting taken over, it seems like it kind of disappears, even if it's a gigantic line, like, um, oh, I don't know. What was that big, big rubber stamp company? Um, rep stamp. Yeah, I, I can't even remember. Some of the biggest companies out there, you know, got absorbed by these other companies or sold out one of these places went out of business but look at this advertising index here it took a whole sheet right here and uh of uh, paper back in this time so like i said uh, just a huge amount of momentum a lot of back issues of rubber stamp madness you know um a lot of them got sold out like there's no back issues available between 104 and 123 right here for example so it looks like they started going into kind of a larger uh, production run because you can see things like from 
you know, 124, 125, 126, 27, you know, there's no breaks in here. But going back um, here, um, you know, they sold out of a lot of those things. So you can probably bet that uh, at some point in time between 104, 1999 and 2002, that's probably when they got into kind of more of the mass um, distribution in a lot of the, uh, you know, the chain types of stores and things like that. You know, the, you know, the Barnes and Noble borders and, you know, those types of stores, you know, so they needed, you know, a higher production run probably. Looking ahead, so they'll go into, uh, you know, things like this, Egyptian African boxes, uh, France, you know, themes, 50s and 60s. So, you know, submit four entries per theme. And, uh, you know, you can still look on the Rubber Stamp Mandis website for um, uh, their themes. And if you, you know, want to take, you know, take a shot at getting published in the magazine, you can submit your uh, pieces. I don't know if they submit them still via hard copy or if you can submit digitally, you know, with a scanned image or something like that. But look at this right here, Brilliant Sync. Okay, so I'm always worried that Brilliant Sync is going to get discontinued, but um, pearlescent beauty and versatility in one ink pad. Finally, a pigment ink that dries fast naturally on vellum and is archival for all your memory projects. Okay, so the only fast drying archival pigment ink ideal for use on vellum, glossy papers, shrink plastic, I didn't even think about that, wood, polymer clay, leather photos, and much more. So photos are something that that emulsion coating on them takes um, water-based media, and these are water-based, you know. Most pigment inks are oil-based, okay. So create cards with beautiful pearlescent shimmering color. Add color to spice up any of your projects. Just turn ink pad over and apply. Okay, so you're just applying it directly from ink pad like that. So, and that is, what is that? Brilliance Mineral. A lot of these colors are not available anymore. So I'd always recommend this type of thing for things like your holographic printable vinyls, um, stamping on foils, which won't adhere to them, but you just spray seal it. But this is the thing that's available. And this, it probably came out around this time. So we're looking at 2004, 20 years ago. I just started using mine not too long ago. You know, it's like discovering, you know, a forgotten type of thing. And a lot of people kind of forgot about it, so. Color box again, you know, they got the back cover here. Used to be all um, Stampa Barbara, but um, by this point in time, they're on. So full color here, Mica Magic, you know, those, um, you know, pearlescent types of uh, colors, you know, and the metallics were becoming uh, all the rage, you know, uh, in uh, stamping. So exciting times. Rubber Stamp Madness. Number 138, thanks for watching.